part three of the story of Naomi and Ruth. Now, just just to to review, so we know where we left off, is remember Ruth. <clears throat> Ruth had gone to glean in, in the field, and it was Boaz's field, and she had found favor with Boaz, um, mostly okay, because she she was very dedicated. She gleaned all day long as she was getting wheat food for her and Naomi. All right. She did not, she did not, I don't know the right word, but she was not attentive to the males around her. I mean, because look, let's, let's face it. <laughs> no matter how many years ago it was, uh, Men will be men and women will be women, some of them. So, so he was, <clears throat> so he was very impressed with her. Um, uh, and remember, she showed respect to Boaz, uh, bowed down before him and gave thanks to him because that was, remember, that was the only means of, of support of food that she and Naomi, she and Naomi would have. And of course, Boaz fed her and invited her to stay the night with his handmaids. Now, um, I guess there's a couple of reasons why, why he invited her to stay there. One reason could possibly be that it was getting late. And you're going to see later on that women were not out in the street that much period, much less at night. And um and he was, like I say, he was pleased with her behavior. And you're gonna see that he he uh allowed her to keep gleaning there and, and to keep getting um food and support for herself and Naomi. So we pick up tonight um where she had just spent she had spent the night there. Um uh, and so we're picking up here with Ruth 2.15 to 19. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this, and then George is going to help me um, read, because we have we have a good, a good amount of scripture to do tonight. So, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his servants, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and do not harm her. And they let her glean between the sheaves, and they did not harm her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about, and I always, I always get this word wrong, but I think it's it's an ephpha, which really is a bushel of barley. And she took it up and went into the city and she showed her mother-in-law what she had gleaned. And she gave her of the food which was left over after she had eaten and was satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? Blessed be the place in which you were and the man in whose eyes you have found favor. Again, at this point, Naomi did not know that this was Boaz. And she told her mother-in-law where she had been and said, the man's name in whose field I glean today is Boaz. Okay. George, you want to do this? Okay. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed is the Lord because he has not caused his kindness to cease from the living nor from the dead. And Naomi said to her, the man is near of kin to us. He is one of our nearest kinsmen. And Ruth said to her mother-in-law, he said to me also, you shall keep close by my servants until all the harvest is finished. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, happy are you, my daughter, for you have kept close to his maidens. 
and no man harmed you in the field, whose owner you did not know. So she kept close by the maidservants of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and Ruth dwelt with her mother-in-law. So that was the means of support for Ruth and her and Naomi at that point in time. And now, let's look, let's kind of look at what was going on here. Okay. Naomi and Ruth were both widows. Um, they did not, they didn't have uh, husbands and therefore uh, they did not have any form of support except for Ruth going and leaning in the fields. So they needed, and what they, they needed a male heir essentially for their survival because as much as we don't like it, the men, you, you had to have a man uh, because that was the means of support. And again, that's why men had so many wives too, uh, because that a woman could not go out to work on her own. Um, so a male heir was needed uh, to carry on the name of Elimelech. And we'll, we'll talk, we're going to talk more about, about the, the idea, the idea of carrying on the name and marriage and so forth. A male heir, okay, would inherit Elimelech's property, and it would be kept in the, in the in the family. The male heir, of course, would have to be of the same same tribe. In other words, um, they would they would have to marry within that tribe. And I believe Na Naomi and the, Naomi's tribe was the was from. Ephraim, the Ephratites. But the idea, the, the whole idea, as you'll see, um, really has to do with keeping the male lineage going. All right. And so, so we have something called leveret marriage, and we're going to read the scriptures about it. But essentially, okay, they had discovered a kinsman. And so Semitic people from the very beginning believed that the continuity of life was in posterity. When a man died without a son, he was cut off from life eternal. Therefore, when a man dies without an heir, the brother of the deceased marries the widow to raise an heir for him. Now that's the law. All right, and then the continuance of life is not really in posterity or, or in the individual, but in the survival of the race. And that's why, the, that's why I mean, even to this day, uh, a, a man uh, keeping, the, keeping the male name, of course, today it's not, there's nowhere near as significant as it was then. That was all there was. And a man had to have a son. And and just just as an aside, culturally speaking, if um uh if um even today when uh when when someone gives birth, if if the if the child that's born is a boy. It's just uh, the biggest celebration, and people come and people. But if it's a if it's a girl, even today, I'm told from firsthand, uh, they'll just hang a, a wreath on the door, and it's just it's just of no significance. And uh, again, that annoys many of us in our world today. But that is the way it was. So, but they have a kinsman. Now, remember, they're, okay, Elimelech was Naomi's husband. All right. And they went to Moab. So 
And Elimelech died when they were in Moab. And so uh, if he had brothers, we don't, they don't say what the relationships are. But even if he had brothers, no, no, this whole thing would not have been carried out because they were in Moab. And so, and the two sons who had married Ruth and Orpah, um, they died also in Moab. So it's a, so it presents a real predicament for the, 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 the family of, of Elimelech. Uh, and of course, as you see, for Ruth and Naomi, because because there was no, they were in Moab, there were no kinsmen there, and but now they have found a kinsman. So now we're going to talk about this thing called love marriage. And okay, so and we're going to go to. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 25. This is where, where it was set up, where the law, where the law, uh, was, um, was, was set up, uh, by Moses. And, uh, that's what they're talking about and what, what they're going to follow, um, uh, in, in the, the next verses to come. But I, I thought, it, I thought it would be neat to, to go to Deuteronomy, because I know that most people don't read the Old Testament, and particularly Numbers and Deuteronomy, because because they have all this nasty stuff. I, I had a friend, um, a friend who just she just went in the Bible. She said, "My father said, my father said the Bible and the, the Old Testament is just just a whole bunch of sex and everything." And so I never did that. Well, it really it's not a whole bunch of sex, but but it's stuff. It's, it's stuff that's hard to read, especially when you're going to realize tonight that this stuff, now this stuff that we're talking about, this is from the Bible now. And the Holy Bible has this stuff. I mean, but <laughs> clearly it does. So Deuteronomy 25. When brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead shall not marry to a stranger, but her husband's brother shall take her, and she shall become his wife, and he shall perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. And it shall be that the firstborn, which she bears, shall be named after the name of his brother who is dead, that his name may not be forgotten in Israel. Now, th this is really cool here, guys. And if the man refuses to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my brother-in-law refuses to raise up to his brother a name in Israel and is unwilling to take me as a wife. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him. And if he should rise up and say, I will not take her, then his sister-in-law shall come to him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and <clears throat> spit in his face and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not raise a family to his brother. <laughs> and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his shoe loose. Now, this, this Mo Moses established this, um, but um, I did to there's not an incident in the Bible that talks about a a uh, the the sister-in-law where where the man wouldn't take his wife um, take her as well. I don't I don't see any any place in the Bible where the woman actually got to do this. But you know it's it's kind of good to know. However, okay, that was that was just. But right after this verse, and it really doesn't have to do with marriage, but I thought 
I thought it was really interesting. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to just put it up here because here we have, okay, the, the, um, the wife has some, some recourse here. Um, okay. Uh, possible cause some revenge or something. However, these next verses <laughs> are real interesting. And I'm sure that most people haven't read it because you don't read these things. But, okay, the next verse is, when two brothers are fighting and the wife of one draws near to deliver her husband out of the hands of his adversary and puts forth her hand and seizes him by the private parts, Whoa. then you shall cut off her hand your eye shall not pity her. Straight from the Holy Bible, folks. <laughs> no, no. Uh, but that, okay, again, all right. Um, they're protecting the, 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 the male lineage. And so if you damage the male lineage parts, well, then, but, you know, uh, again, this is in, this is from the Bible, but I don't. I haven't seen any in instances in the Bible. There's no stories about a woman getting her hand cut off because she did that. But anyway, I thought you. I thought you'd enjoy that, and probably never would would read it. Okay. So now, all right. Now there's another. Um, uh, there, there's there's another part of of the. Inheritance, and we had a question about this about property, and and yes, I I did say that women, for the most part, did not own property. Okay, the only time, and we we, we read that uh, there, the only time is if there was uh, uh, if they inherited it, and so Numbers twenty seven eight through eleven. And you shall say to the children of Israel, if a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. And he, if he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. And if he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, and you shall give his inheritance to his kinsman that is next to him of his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, in in Naomi's case, uh, we don't know for sure uh, the what what relationship Boaz was. We know he was. He was a kinsman and her, and he was male. So so when when they when Naomi and Elimelech left um Judah, their property that they had, and, and, and they were fairly well off, uh more than likely um uh, went to whatever the order of the inheritance. Uh, was and so so now we're going to see now we're going to see who and how this this inheritance stuff is going to work with Naomi and Ruth George you want to go ahead and read that then Naomi said to her my daughter <laughs> shall I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you and behold Boaz is our kinsman with whose maidens you were and behold, he is going to winnow barley, I'm sorry, barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash yourself, therefore, and anoint yourself and put on your best garments and go down the, to the threshing floor. But do not show yourself to him until he has finished eating and drinking. OK, this this starts the this starts the part of root that um, has been misinterpreted um, in a what I would call a very inappropriate way but 
it has to do with it has to do with the culture. If you don't understand the culture, uh, then then you you're going to you're you're going to make assumptions, and that is what has happened here with Ruth, uh, chap chapter three, and this is where uh, this, this is kind of my um, I I guess I have a cause, and I always wanted to um, I, I I always I always wanted to make make sure. And I call it redeeming Ruth. It's a different. It's different from the redeeming that that the Hebrew and the Hebrew Bibles talk about. But I'm just saying, I'm just going to redeem redeem uh, Ruth from the characterization that has been applied to her. And you will you you will see even if you look stuff up in the Bible. Yes, there will be the positive stuff that we've already about Ruth um, and her. Commitment to God and Naomi, but they avoid this part like a plague. And uh, so we'll talk more about this. Anyway, so, um, and what, one, of, one of the things that I, when I read this, I, I, I was having a real problem with this and anoint yourself. And I just didn't really know, but I did find out from Dr. Erica. Okay. Anointing, anointing. It's not the same as 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 when the prophets anointed things. It just means. Well, he put it like it's 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 like you put cream on your face or whatever. And they did use olive oil, probably still do. So, um. Anyway, I just wanted to clarify that because I had a problem with that this week, and. So I got that clarified. So, I mean, okay, yes, she was putting on her. She did want to make a good impression to Boaz. And, oh. and yes, she, you know, she was hoping that, and Naomi were, were hoping that Boaz would come forth and, um, and do his duty like we, like we just read about. And so, uh, so yeah, she she you know she put on uh, garments and whatnot, but you know it's not like now we apply our culture here and this you know when it starts right here oh well mm -hmm. you know she's she's um and, and if you if you look at it they'll say well she she was seducing Boaz and and I mean that's crazy she was not seducing Boaz and we'll see we'll see what the <laughs> what the situation further is. All right, so I, I took these verses out because these are the verses that that are so different, and this this is where a lot of the a lot of the condescension comes from. So, uh, all right, so K KJV. Um, I'll go ahead and read uh, KJV. George, you can read lots of. All right, and it shall be. When he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down. Dear God, what words they say. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. Okay, George, you want to read Lamsa? Okay, and it shall be when he lies down that you shall remember the place where he lies. And you shall draw near and lie down near his feet, and he will tell you what you shall do. Okay. The difference, the, the difference in translation you'll see here is it says that he will uncover his feet and lay down. And that particular phrase, according to um Dr. Lonsa and Dr. that that's what started the ball rolling about about she. You know, she slept with him and all that kind of stuff. So, and, and, but she lied down near his feet is the proper translation. And, okay. And she said to her, all that you say to me, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor 
and did according to all that her mother-in-law had told her. All right, verse seven again, again is, is very different. Okay, I, I'll get KGV, George, we'll get lost. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went and lay at the side of the threshing floor. And while he was in deep sleep in the, in the threshing floor, she came secretly and lifted the end of his robe and lay down near his feet. Okay, now, all right, first of all, let's talk about, uh, okay, well, I got this here. All right, and I have the picture of the threshing floor. So so what we're talking about here is, is they would have mounds of wheat or barley, whatever it was, on the threshing floor. And that is where they would sleep. Um, th this is during the harvest. That's where they would sleep, uh, uh, mostly because of to protect the wheat and and or the barley and not have somebody steal it. Uh, that was that was just their their customary. And harvest was a celebration. Uh, I mean, you know. Uh, so yes, he you know he was. Uh, ate, drank, and, and was merry, and then and then he lay down on the threshing floor um, to go, you know, to go to bed. Um, so, but we have to we have to think about the culture and Ruth. Okay, going, okay. We already know that Ruth Ruth gleaned in his fields and she was she was there at his place day after day. And yet, okay. She didn't, she, 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 he, he did not know that she was a kinsman. And, but you see, women did not talk to men in public. Now, you know, and what we saw before is that he approached her, yes, and she ate and whatnot. But women, women do not talk to, to people uh, in the street. Um, and, in order for her to, in order for her to let Boaz know that she was a near, that he was a near kinsman, this is what they had to do, because she couldn't just walk up to him while from taking her break from gleaning and say, "Hey, Boaz, I'm your kinsman." That was cultural, and that did not happen, and that's why she had to go at night. Because because it, it would it would have been scandalous had she tried to seduce him or go you know go go near. Um, so and basically she went at night so that people would not see her. Um, people would not see her. It wasn't just that she didn't that they didn't want Boaz to see her, but there were lots of other people. And so anyway. I just just need to get the background straight because we 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 just think it in totally different ways. Um and so basically this was this was their only alternative um to to let him know that he was a kinsman. Now we already know that she found favor with him, but that was because she was a virtuous woman so to speak and she didn't she didn't mess around with the young men and whatnot so just wanted to get that straight um because that's when you don't understand the culture be, behind this then then you're going to get the interpretations that that i got and learned even from ministers in the seminary okay so and we need to think about this too. Ruth's act of sleeping at his feet 
implied that she was at his mercy and was needing help. She she had a request. She had something to say. And think, if you think about it, there's many episodes in the Bible where people would go to the king and they would bow down at the king's feet and they were trying to get the king's attention because they needed something. They wanted something. This is what she was doing. She wasn't seducing uh, uh, Boaz. Okay. Okay. And uncover his feet, as we just saw, is not present in the Aramaic text. It reads, lie down near his feet. Ruth had to lift the end of his robe in order to lie down near his feet. There was no physical intimacy between Boaz and Ruth, as the Hebrew text and some biblical commentators might imply because of the phrase uncovering his feet. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm going to, this is kind of like a courtroom here. I'm going to uh, provide some, some, um, some proof here. Okay. I, this, this, of course, is a picture now, uh, not, not, a, not a very happy man, but <laughs> it's difficult to find pictures that are accurate. But you see, okay, they said she had, she had to lift the end of his robe. Well, essentially, um, essentially, the robe is what, is what he wore. But remember, they they wore um, um, several layers, okay, and in many in many cases, all right, and they didn't have pajamas, okay, they didn't have night clothes, they just had those clothes, uh, but but the um, but many times and could have been the case here that outer the outer um, the outer layer the, uh, the the robe the outer robe they would take it off and they would cover it up okay uh cover themselves up like a blanket so probably that may have been the case she had to lift it up so why did she have to get under the robe so that nobody else would see her because if someone else saw her and they she would be totally ruined because she would be part of the scandal and she would never get anywhere. So that's why she that's why she had to, to do that. Now another interesting scripture that <laughs> that that came to mind uh and I thought well we'll we'll just um we we'll just do this. Um it it doesn't exactly um uh, it doesn't help exactly help my cause that that she wasn't seducing him, but I, I just, th this just came to me, and it is from the Holy Bible, okay? And we go to the verse of Exodus 20, 26, and, and it, it's talking about when they built an altar and stuff, and so it says, neither shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. So if you could picture steps and going up, there could be a problem. Why? Because undergarments were not worn then. And if they had the steps and the people were below, well, you know what? So um, I just had to put this in here. And if you look at your long survival, Exodus 20, 26, um, there is a footnote that says undergarments were not worn then. So again, the Holy Bible has lots of good stuff, unholy stuff sometimes. Okay. All right, George, go ahead. Well, no, I'll do King James. All right. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself 
And behold, the woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth thine handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. Got that? Okay, George. And it came to pass at midnight that the man woke up and was startled when he saw a woman lying at his feet. And he said to her, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your handmaid. Cover therefore your maidservant with the end of your robe, for you are a near kinsman. Okay. Da, da, da. All right. Uh, notice notice the, the difference here. And it says, it, it, and again, it's just the way this, this could be construed about saying, okay, spread thy skirt over thine hand, handmaid. Well, it's really just a difference in, in translation. Once, you know, uh, once again, uh, you see the difference in the verses, but the, the word, the word for skirt in Aramaic, uh, it technically, it just refers to an outer, outer garment worn by a person, but there's other meanings to it. And, and when it said, um, the take the edge of the, the edge of the robe, um, and 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 put it over me. Well, that's just a little difference in the in, in the translation. Uh, but you know, let's go back to the man. They okay. They often did refer to like the the very bottom and some some um, some some robes and pictures you'll see that they did refer to like the 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 very bottom. Of, of the robe as a as a skirt. And there there's a place with Saul and David where it says they cut off the, the skirt of their robe. And that that is like the bottom. So um, anyway. Okay. So and Boaz said to her, Blessed be you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness in the latter days than at the beginning of your life, in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, fear not, for I will do for you all that you ask of me, for all the family of our people know that you are a virtuous woman. Now, I just put this in here because it it doesn't necessarily mean that much, but but in in here in in the KJV it says I will do to thee all that thou requirest. It, you know, it, it it's a uh, instead of I will do for you. So again, just 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 a little other reason. Uh, for a misinterpretation. So, all right. Thank you for your contributions. And so, uh, I'm just gonna. I, I I just put this put this out here. I mean, um, so so have we justified the fact that Ruth was not sedu seducing? And I'll just state my my little story again and how I really got 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 into this. Um, I had a a very very good friend, minister man, um, and he has passed now, but. Uh, but we could have these kind of discussions. And so the, the idea of Ruth came up and, and of course, Ruth is one of the most mistranslated, uh, books of the Bible. And so it just came up and, and, and we were talking and, and, and I don't know if I said something about, you know, chapter three or whatever. And, uh, 
And he just said, well, well, she slept with him. I mean, you know, and so this is, this is, this, this is, this is a, a seminary, traditional seminary guy. And so, you know, I just said, well, you know, okay. I, I, you know, I mean, I hung on to it, but then it just, it just wouldn't matter. Wherever I would go, uh, a, a client one time, I don't even know how the subject came up. And, but the same interpretation. Well, a woman's got to do what a woman's got to do. So that interpretation holds in many respects. And you will not see, I, I don't know, like I say, that we'll talk about on, on the pulpit, the, the first part of how devoted she was to, to Naomi and the God of Israel and whatnot. Uh, but, but, and, and if you, and if you go online and you read, the, the, you know, just to look up the stuff, and they, they shy away from this chapter three like like it's the play. So anyway, so was Ruth's behavior that of a virtuous woman? Have, have we justified the fact that, that she's not a, is it a seductress? Uh, she didn't seduce him. Anyway, okay, I'm going to stop this.